Okay, I think we can get started. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Brian Cipriano. I'm the project chairperson of the uh, OpenQ TSC. Uh, welcome to our open source day presentation. Um, so we have a few speakers today. Uh, I'm going to be running through a quick project update. Um, and then I'll hand off to some of the other folks we have. Um, we'll have a uh, hopefully, hopefully some time for Q and A at the at the end. Uh, so feel free to uh, drop your Q and A questions uh, in the uh, in in the Q and A box, and uh, we'll get to them afterwards. Uh, we may run out of time, so uh, at the end we'll move to the uh, Open Q Slack, where we'll continue to be online for a while and, and get to any any leftover questions there. Um, cool. So uh, I'll get started. Um, I'm just going to give a quick quick update on what OpenQ has been up to for the past uh, year since our last uh, last open source day session at, as a ref last year. Um, cool. So some of the stuff we've we've come out with in the last year, um, we released uh, the so the original guide that we came out with uh, when OpenQ was first released was uh, a bit complex, pretty long. Um, you know, we heard some some feedback that it was tough to kind of get get up and running quickly uh, just to try OpenQ out first. Uh, so we put together a, uh, a sandbox deployment uh, that uses Docker Compose and runs on a single machine and you know, basically lets you get an OpenQ uh, deployment up and running with a, a couple of commands. Um, so we'll share, uh, we'll have our slides posted after this. Uh, you can follow the link here, it just goes to our website, openq.io where there's some, some getting started docs. Uh, we also released a bunch of contributor guides. Um, We've had a lot of kind of interest from new contributors, and we use that uh, that experience to put together um, guides for getting started within a development environment for uh, all you know Mac, Windows, and Linux. We have separate guides for each of them. The um, the kind of biggest new feature that we've been working on is uh, Windows support. I think at this time last year we had uh, zero Windows support. Uh, so since then we've moved through. Uh, through an alpha phase and did a bunch of testing, and, and now that's uh, we're happy to announce that that's moved into a beta phase now. Um, we have a few a few folks who are running it uh, steadily in production and um, uh, seem to be quite happy with it. So uh, that's good to see. Uh, we have we participated along with the rest of the ASWF in uh, Google Summer of Code this year, uh, and our uh, Summer of Code student has been working on some uh, some. Cloud support, a cloud support plugin for uh, the, the Q GUI, which I'll uh, I'll show a bit of in a in a second. We have uh, recently completed our migrate migrating all of our CI environment to GitHub Actions to align with the rest of the ASWF. Um, so happy to see that wrapped up. And then, kind of the biggest, uh, I, I think the kind of biggest thing we've been working on is uh, tons of kind of small improvements and bug fixes and. Stuff like that really worked on, uh, you know, stability and uh, performance, and kind of finishing up all of the stuff that uh, went on during the open source uh, open sourcing process uh, before it was released. Um, I would say that, you know, kind of the big thing that we we learned in the last year was we spent a lot more time on on fixing minor stuff uh, than, and we didn't get to some of the bigger ticket items that we had hoped. But um, uh, I think it was all well worth it and, and a good lesson learned. Um, so. We just a couple days ago, days ago cut a new release, uh, 0 0.4.55. That's up on GitHub now. Uh, that contains that is basically basically all the way up to date with the master branch of uh, OpenQ. So it has all the latest bug fixes and stuff like that. I think the some of the biggest stuff it contains is a, a big batch of the uh, of fixes for Windows. So uh, big thanks to the folks from uh, from Microsoft and from SBI who have done a lot of the kind of heavy lifting on the Windows support. Um, so just a quick preview of the, uh, the Cloud Manager plugin uh, that is uh, coming out soon. Uh, we're going to have some functionality built into QGUI for uh, creating groups of uh, machines in the cloud. Uh, this will be this has been designed in a way where it'll work uh, with uh, with really any cloud. We're hoping to release it with uh, GCP and Azure and AWS support. Um, but it will basically allow you to, you know, create and scale uh, machine groups. It's all seamlessly integrated with OpenQ um, and the existing RQD setup. So that's really nice to see. This is a screenshot of the uh, the UI as we have it now for creating cloud groups, and then a shot of uh, what it'll look like uh, when you have groups existing already. You can see that they're see what they're doing and how many machines are in there and uh, 
a little bit of other information about them. Um, so actually a, a bit more on that. Uh, so Summer of Code wraps up soon at the end of this month uh, and hopefully the initial version of this should get released uh, shortly after that. But we'll see where, where things are at at the end of uh, the Summer of Code period. Uh, some quick stats from the past year. Uh, we've seen both the uh, pool of contributors and committers grow pretty significantly. Um, and we have uh, uh, 24 folks who have contributed code, uh, six people now in the, uh, in the committers pool, which is great to see, uh, really nice growth there. Um, merged about three and a half PRs a week, which is about the same as we were at last year. So that's good kind of maintaining velocity there, except it's coming from a much more diverse pool of contributors, which, which is good and much more kind of maintainable. And we're closing about 100, we've closed about 112 issues in the past year, which is, uh, gives you an idea of many, many kind of minor issues that we've, that we've closed up. A uh, few bits and uh, pieces from uh, that we're looking at for the next year. Some of these will look familiar since, as I mentioned, we spent a lot more time on the kind of minor stuff uh, recently. Uh, we definitely want to keep working on uh, Windows support and getting that a lot, uh, you know, a lot more stable. I think we're still lacking in the docs uh, department there. Uh, so we'd like to see uh, our documentation grow, uh, especially around getting started guides, the kind of stuff we have good support for on Linux and uh, already. So. Um, user management and permission system, that's, that's been a kind of big ask and a, a big piece of work uh, that's still high on our list uh, we'd like to see happen. Uh, packaging and installers, you know, kind of make it, make it a lot easier to um, install the OpenQ components, especially the client side stuff. Um, it's, I think we've made some progress. We have an RPM installer for QBot now, but the, the client side stuff is still kind of lacking, still requires a lot of creating virtual environments and uh, running Python commands. And uh, we'd like to see that get, get a lot smoother and integrated with some native OS tools. Um, expanded cloud support. Uh, we want to keep building on the stuff that we're building as part of Summer of Code. We'd like to see that grow uh, even more, um, you know, have get things to work even better in the cloud and in hybrid environments. Uh, you know, and we want to keep growing the contributor pool as well. I think the progress we made is good and uh, we've made some good, we have some pretty good procedures now for, you know, trying to bring in new contributors and promote uh, existing contributors to committers. Uh, we want to keep doing more of that. Um, and uh, big thing on the ASWF front, uh, we want to uh, get the, the project to graduate to full status. We recently had our uh, incubation period extended for another six months to the end of the year. And uh, we're looking to, to wrap that up soon and get, uh, get the project to be a, a fully established project. A few bits to get involved. Uh, those will all be linked in the, in the slides after. OpenQ.io is, uh, you know, has uh, all the documentation, links to basically all this other stuff. Um, so definitely start there. Link to our GitHub repo, uh, the users and developers mailing lists, uh, which we've seen some good activity on, and the, uh, the Slack channel. Uh, you know, we're definitely around there. Slack, go to uh, slack.aswf.io to sign up and join the Slack. Um, we're on the OpenQ channel and uh, yes, it's also been linked in the chat. Um, so yeah, definitely uh, check that out and we'll, we'll be around in the Slack uh, after this session to answer any questions you have in addition to the Q&A that we're doing as part of this session. So um, next, I will hand it off to Ben Dines with Sony Pictures Imageworks. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Ben Dines and I work at Sony Pictures Imageworks. At last year's Open Source Day, I talked about the history of Q3, which was our internal render management software that became OpenQ. Since last year, we've begun the transition from our old Q3 system to the standard OpenQ build. And uh, for our transition, we've had uh, two major milestones so far. Uh, in January, we kicked off our first show entirely on OpenQ. And then uh, in May, we migrated our uh, entire database backend for, the, for OpenQ from Oracle to Postgres, uh, which then opened the door for uh, the open source project to, to drop Oracle support completely, which was a blocking issue for a number of things. And uh, so, now that that's in progress, I, you know, I'd love to be able to tell you some interesting stories about the migration progress and all the profound things we learned. Um, but uh, it actually went really, really smoothly um, for what it's worth. 
uh, other than just straightforward database migrations and, and the usual stuff, uh, there were no major caveats uh, or anything like that. So uh, hopefully that would bode well for anyone else uh, attempting to do something similar. So in the meantime, uh, we had a lot of code to pour over uh, to the new tool set and API. Uh, there are really two parts to this, uh, the command line and the GUI tools, uh, the built-in ones, and, uh, and our own internal queue management tools. Getting the built-in tools up and running was a close collaboration between our own internal dev team and the open source team. And porting our internal queue management tools involved converting over 12 years worth of Python scripts of varying quality. Uh, and so it was a task that we distributed across our dev team and our render management teams. And uh, just to quickly go over the transition to Postgres, it was, uh, it was actually a big deal for us uh, after so many years of relying on Oracle so heavily uh, and, and their support contracts. Uh, but uh, in preparation for the switch, uh, we needed to make sure we had worked out uh, whatever support contracts we needed for Postgres and uh, had a solid backup and restore strategy and had performance and health monitoring tools in place. And uh, as I just mentioned, uh, we rely on a number of custom built tools for interacting with OpenQ. Uh, most of these were actually built under Q3, uh, but luckily porting them was just a matter of updating API calls. Uh, and while these are all tools that are internal to ImageWorks, uh, they should illustrate how much is possible with the built-in frameworks, uh, whether it comes to building pipelines or just retrieving useful information about rendering progress uh, in, in a way that's easy to uh, scale and support a render farm on the order of hundreds of thousands of processors. Uh, in OpenQ, uh, job submission is done via outline files, which describe the job in full detail, including the tasks to be performed, the arrangement into layers, and any necessary dependencies to dictate execution order. Uh, these outline files can be composed in either XML or YAML. Of course, neither of these two formats lends itself to the amount of data entry necessary uh, for a, a large rendering pipeline, but fortunately, uh, there is OpenQ includes the framework PyOutline, uh, which wraps around those built-in outline specifications, uh, allowing rendering jobs to be created programmatically. In fact, it's, uh, it's actually very rare for a user to need to manipulate those outline files directly. Uh, describing and composing render jobs programmatically then also opens the door to significant automation, uh, especially when it comes to integrating with existing pipelines. Uh, at ImageWorks, uh, we've leveraged this advantage into uh, custom UIs, actually, for most of our DCCs. Uh, here's an example from Nuke. And because we were, uh, oh, and, uh, to, oh, and to elaborate a little bit more, here's Houdini. Uh, this is a standard node graph. It should look pretty familiar. And, uh, and because we're able to integrate job submission uh, so easily with Houdini, uh, something like this where you have elaborate node graphs, uh, those can be easily translated into uh, queue jobs. Uh, for instance, in this case, each node that you're seeing in the node graph uh, becomes a separate layer. And, uh, and then the flow between the nodes is translated into layer dependencies in the queue job itself. Besides PyOutline, uh, another area where we've been able to use the, the Python API to our advantage is in queue monitoring tools. Uh, these are crucial for ensuring render farm efficiency, tracking progress, and spotting problems. Uh, the APIs provide real-time information pulled directly from the backend database. Uh, the APIs for high-level job info are also very lightweight. Uh, which means uh, thousands of jobs can actually be queried in a matter of seconds. Uh, this also makes uh, extracting data insights from OpenQ very easy. Uh, we have a number of relatively simple scripts uh, and other automations that record the goings on of the queue at all times. 
Here's an example of one of the web-based monitoring tools that we built for Q3. Uh, it will display all the Q jobs for a given substring match and then uh, gives you vital stats about each one. Another uh, extremely useful way of tracking Q data is with time series reporting. Uh, for example, uh, we have several tools built around RRD and Grafana. Here's a Grafana page report uh, showing um, show level frame stats and core stats. And here's one reporting department level frame and core stats. And uh, for us at ImageWorks, uh, data insights like this are absolutely critical for projecting future render farm needs, uh, especially in the long term, since they can be correlated with past, current, and future production workload. And uh, finally, here's some RRD examples that we built originally for Q3. Uh, and those are reporting cluster level stats for monitoring the overall health of the system, uh, which is obviously very important as the whole thing scales up uh, and moves into the cloud. And uh, now I will hand off to Diego about some of the uh, development efforts we've been doing at ImageWorks. Hi everyone, I'm Diego. I work at ImageWorks with Ben. And let's get my phone. And as Ben mentioned, we were running OpenQ on Oracle before, as Oracle was the database we were used to. And the Q3, which originated OpenQ, used to run on Oracle. But it was part of our plan to migrate to Postgres. And before pushing the change to production, we really wanted to be sure that the Postgres, Postgres solution for OpenQ will handle the load that we used to handle on Oracle before. And for that, we decided to go with a stress test just to assess the booking capacity running the solution on Postgres. And just to, get, to have an idea of the, the hardware that we were running on, for the server side, the QBot, we were running on three VMs with 12 gigabytes of RAM each. And those VMs will be on, under a load balancer. So they will be getting all the load distributed. And for the hosts, the rendered form, you are running around 63,000 cores. And for and those were running on bare metal machines. And for the database, we have two new bare metal machines with 16 cores each and 90 gigabytes of RAM. And they were running on a master standby mode. So only one of the hosts will be getting the, the hits. The other one will just come up if the, the, the master one fails. And to give an idea of the kind of jobs we were running, we were running one to two minute jobs. And they were just simulation jobs. And uh, the way the task will work, it will start to book the queue slowly and ramp up up to a point where I will try to book as many jobs as it will be possible. And on the biggest task we ran, we had 120,000 jobs and we were able to run 63,000 jobs at the same time. And if you remember on the last slide, this is the amount of hosts we have. So we were able to fully book the whole queue uh, running jobs on this task. And with the, this big task, we were only using 18% of the memory of the server peak times and 21% of the memory of the database. And for the tasks, we, what we ran a set of tasks ranging from five jobs on a task up to 120,000 jobs. And the idea with that is that we'll be able to, to have a curve pointing how the system will behave over load. So we can see how the system is behaving under low load and under heavy load. And as we can see, it's pretty linear which is a good thing. And this means that OpenQ didn't get in the way. So it will handle distributing the jobs as fast as it's possible to distribute. And uh, one good news that we had, as Brian mentioned, we are finally on beta stage for OpenQ on Windows. And we are currently on ImageWorks running uh, Windows hosts on OpenQ on production. And what this means is that we are able to have one single server 
that is running on Linux, uh, managing jobs that run on Windows or on Linux. So we can have Unreal running on Windows and at the same time have Nuke running on Linux for the same show and having the server distributing the jobs based on the OS that the job is tagged to run on. And as we are talking about Windows, now I'll pass the word to Eoin from Microsoft. Thanks, Diego. Yeah, so my name is Owen Bailey. I work at Microsoft. Let me just uh, take back control. OK. And I'm on the Azure Storage Media and Edge team. And I'm going to talk about uh, deploying OpenQueue on Azure. This is going to be a little bit of a callback to two things that Brian mentioned, actually. So how can you make it easier to deploy uh, an environment uh, and also make use of the client. And uh, very briefly, I'm just going to mention one thing about this. Uh, so in the last week, we have released opensource.microsoft.com. It's our new central uh, hub, central location for the thousands of open source projects that we both are uh, releasing ourselves and support. Um, and it just is a great place to go and see information about the philosophy of open source at Microsoft, which may be different to uh, what you may have heard in the past. OK, so the, the number one location uh, that we're going to go for this demo is aka.ms forward slash open queue. That's a GitHub repository. There's dozens of different examples in there that are all media focused. But that link is going to bring you straight to uh, the OpenQueue specific examples. So let me just go straight over there now. That's probably the easiest. And we'll reconnect that. OK. So in here, let me go back. We have two different OpenQueue examples. Uh, one is if you already have your data stored into in an Azure blob account, uh, which is very useful if you don't want to be downloading large amounts of assets over and over again. But we're going to start on this new storage one. So this is where you have no uh, environment set up in Azure at all, no data at all. And we have uh, you know, a high-level overview of the architecture for what we're going to deploy now and how we're going to go about deploying it. So we're going to end up with a network, a virtual network with multi multiple subnets, uh, one for our OpenQueue server that will only have access to uh, two ports. So there'll be SSH and one for a, a VNC connection. We're going to have our, our render nodes um, and our caching cluster, which will be connected to our Azure blob storage. So Azure blob storage is, you know, it's, it's low cost, it's durable, but it's not going to give you the performance you need to be feeding data to, to hundreds of different uh, node instances. So that's why we have a cache as well. So here are the deployment instructions. We're going to use the Azure Cloud Shell. So let me just uh, split these out. Oh, no, that's not what I want to do. There we go. Oh, dear. on. OK. OK. So uh, the readme contains all the steps that we're going to go through now. So the Azure Cloud Shell is a bash and PowerShell environment, if you choose. Uh, it has your Azure CLI already built in. It has Terraform and a couple of other tools we're going to use. Um, second step, make sure you're in the right subscription in Azure. I already know I am in my account here. Uh, accept the terms and conditions for the FXT. So the FXT is the, the caching device that we're going to use. Make sure you have the Terraform provider installed into your Cloud Shell. Again, I already have that here. Um, so we can see it's in .terraform here. That is the provider for the Avira VFXT and HPC cache. So that's open source. Again, it's part of the same repository. So now let's clone this repository.
And once that is done, we'll set up the sparse checkout just to make sure we only have the files that we are interested in right now. Okay. Okay, so now let's take a look at that Terraform file. We can open it up in the code editor directly in the Cloud Shell. Let's make it a little bit bigger for a minute. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of everything that's in this Terraform script, um, but for now, there's really just a few things that we need to set to make sure that we can deploy this. So we need to get my SSH key. We're going to deploy, let's say, let's say we deploy 16 nodes of 64 cores each. So we'll get over 1,000 cores. And that's it. Everything else we can leave as the defaults. So we'll initialize our Terraform environment. So this is going to download any modules that are referenced in here. It's going to make sure that the uh, HPC cache provider is accessible. And uh, oh. oh, that's always fun, isn't it? Well, luckily, I have a backup plan. So we can. Uh, Go over here. So it looks like I may have run out of space in my environment. Um, so this one's already initialized. Um, uh, no. So it's already initialized the Terraform uh, modules and scripts, uh, or sorry, and, uh, and the provider is already there. And then it's a matter of Terraform, apply, auto approve. And that's going to make sure that everything is deployed as it should be. Because I've already deployed this one, because we're not going to wait 20 minutes. It's saying, yes, everything is the way it should be. Um, so, we will take a look at what's being deployed in a minute, but I really want to talk about what is going on in that Terraform script. So the Terraform script itself is, as I said, it's deploying your network, it's deploying storage accounts, it's deploying the cache. Most of these are either modules or um, uh, using the provider, and then the Open queue is the, the queue bot here. It's simply a VM where we use CloudNS to set up all the various um, various installs that we need. So I want to take a look in there as well. Let's make that a little bit bigger. Um, and I'd love to get any feedback on, on how to make this better as well. So for example, uh, low hanging fruit. At the moment, this is all installed on one machine for uh, for OpenQ. So, like the database exists on the same uh, the same machine. Uh, you know, next steps is definitely to to split that aid into its own uh, platform service, so that it uh, it can be more performant. Uh, one other thing that's sort of interesting in here, I mean, most of these steps are the the standard steps from the documentation for how you install. Uh, it's called QBoss, install QGUI, QSubmit, um, PyOutline. Um, but it's mounting the cache. So all of the uh, the nodes, both the QBoss uh, VM and the render nodes, are going to mount one of the VMs from the caching cluster. And so we'll, spot, we'll pop over here. So we use two different techniques uh, in this demo. So one is CloudInish to set up the QBoss. And then this is using a shell script instead that is um, 
it's actually downloaded and stored in the cache so that all of the render nodes as they come up can, can pull down this script and deploy it as needed. So we make sure that we have the cache mounted. And then this is these are the steps that are more interesting and more specific to this demonstration. So we install PBRT, install the requirements for that. And the reason that we use PBRT here is because we're using the Disney Moana Island scene. And there are um, frames ready to render with PBRT. Uh, there's samples here for if it was already in your cache. So using the pre-existing storage, I have a pre-built version of a PBRT. And you know, yum if you're using uh, using yum base installs. And then the same is true down here for setting up RQD and making sure that it connects back to the Qbot, which we'll go take a quick look at now. So this is uh, Windows Terminal, by the way, which if you haven't seen is, I, I think is great. I've got my Ubuntu PowerShell command prompt and I can add Azure Cloud Shell and other uh, Linux distributions through uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux too, which is kind of great. So let me set up an SSH tunnel. I'm going to connect to the machine. OK. And let me just make that a little bit larger. OK. So here we have um, the different nodes that I've, I started up earlier. I started one job earlier already. Uh, this is one of the 4K frames. Um, so I just started one, but we can uh, start another. Um, so we'll just submit another job. Obviously, it's just going to appear here, be picked up by one of the waiting nodes. Um, I have the completed frames just for convenience. Uh, obviously, all the logs are available. And here we have the 4K scene. It's not going to look amazing, obviously, on a remote connection and then streamed as well. But we have several other frames available from that same Moana Island scene collection. So any any questions, please feel free to, to share the mouse, put them in the Q&A, put them in the Slack channel. And that is OpenQ running on Azure. Scale this up as, as large as you want. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Han. That looks great. Uh, so cool. So we can move to Q&A now. Uh, yeah, as Owen said, uh, drop in the Q&A window and get to them. Or yeah, feel free to also visit our Slack at any time. You know, we're always, always there. Um, and uh, we're happy to get to get to your questions then. Um, so yeah, so we've got a few questions in the, uh, the Q&A right now. Um, so let's start with this first one. Uh, are there any planned integrations between OpenQ and any BI or data analytics tool sets, visualization tools? Um, yeah, so I think Greg, actually, I think you were maybe the, the most recent person to be taking a look at some of this. I will say that there's no, there's uh, nothing like that is, I think, super high priority on the, like, the project-wide roadmap right now, though we have definitely kicked around some, some ideas about the best, uh, best tools that we can integrate with uh, in the future. Yeah, exactly. I think um, one of the, the keys here is I don't, we don't necessarily have any specific integrations planned, but um, I, what we want to really do is expose the hooks so that way you can create any integration you want to your analytics platform and really make it flexible. So that way some of the, the queuing decisions, things like that, uh, some of the resource information that's flowing into OpenQ right now and um, the same type of information that Ben was showing, scraping uh, from the OpenQ DB and uh, piping into Grafana and uh, their analytics platform, just making that easier to really access and get at. Um, so that, that's really the work that we have planned, I would say. Yeah. 
and definitely once we like when that does develop uh the ideas i think that we would uh you know because we're shipping uh like docker images uh, of all the maiden components we would be able to basically release a a version of the Docker image that has like an example deployment here. So, you know, probably something like Grafana uh, to, that's set up to run alongside Qbot or the database and, uh, you know, give, give folks something that they can build on from that. Um, okay, so let's see. The next question is kind of related. Uh, will any of the tools internal to ImageWorks make it into the OpenQ package? Um, yeah, I mean, I will say in general that We've, we've seen a bunch of uh, stuff make its way back into the, um, the main OpenQ branch already. Uh, this has been mostly things like, uh, you know, the Windows support and bug fixes and, and stuff like that. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, if Ben or Diego, you have anything specific you'd like to mention there? Um, but yeah, we're, we're definitely always, we're, we're, we're uh, you know, constantly kind of talking to, to ImageWorks to see what we can do to kind of, uh, if they come up with any cool stuff, fold it back into the main, main branch. Yeah. And on our side, everything that it's generic enough that we can share will definitely post to the open source version. Uh, okay, we've got, let's see. Question, uh, it might be obvious if I read the docs, but how are licenses for applications and renderers solved? Right, so, uh, so right now OpenQ does not really do anything around uh, licensing or around kind of managing the configuration of the render nodes. Uh, it does rely, or, or I guess the other big thing to mention there is the, uh, the file server, like asset storage as well. I think Owen showed, showed a way where you can uh, use like uh, Veer VFXDs to provide that, but it is definitely a, a thing that users have to provide uh, on their own right now. Yeah, so the uh, question is, uh, does Sony feel they've reached parity with Q3 on the show uh, done on OpenQ? So I'll answer that. Uh, yeah, it, in fact, uh, OpenQ, I would say, is already, you know, well beyond where Q3 is. Uh, the reason for our slow adoption of it has nothing to do with feature parity and everything to do with um, that database uh, migration that I talked about. Uh, that was kind of the biggest thing just because the, the scale that we're using a database like that um, really demands um, solid support contracts. And um, given that we're used to dealing directly with a company like Oracle, we had to reevaluate how we were going to you know, have, you know, uh, service license agreements and all that stuff. Um, and, uh, and also just making sure that, uh, that we could put everything kind of through its paces. Uh, we didn't want to go and, and start the whole thing off just, you know, dumping, you know, a hundred thousand procs on it all at once. So that's why we started off a uh, little, you know, a little bit at a time. Next question is, um, where's it? all right. Could you talk a bit about multi-platform support, uh, how Linux windows would play together from a user's perspective? Yeah, so, um, so right now the uh, OpenQ is fairly agnostic when it comes to the, uh, the render hosts. It, it doesn't, uh, doesn't, isn't very opinionated about you know, what, what OS it's running or where it's running, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud. Uh, pretty much if you're able to get RQD running, it's able to do that communication. Um, so uh, in, in that sense, things play well together. The, the big caveat to that right now is that there, is, there isn't really a concept of uh, like drive mapping in OpenQ. Um, so, you know, uh, when, you're, when you're building a job submission and submitting your job, you're basically specifying either Windows or Linux paths, uh, and those are kind of making their way back to the, uh, the RQD instance. Uh, so kind of the jobs need to pick one platform um, for now, but um, I think that's the that's the main caveat. I think we do we have been kicking around ideas for uh, for how to fix that. I mean, obviously the the concept of drive mapping is a pretty well established concepts uh, within the industry and other tools. So we're not really treading any new ground there. But uh, it's definitely 
you know, when, when I, we talk about how we want to build out Windows support more in the next, uh, over the next year, I think that's definitely a big thing that, that we'll want to cover, uh, the ability to, to kind of send jobs to a mixed platform. Okay, it looks like Greg's got the next one. Yeah, the next question was, is there any plans to break out the database and other components into a more pay-as-you-go or serverless type setup? Like Brian was talking about, OpenQ, uh, you know, we really want to maintain that, that open nature with it and uh, allow it to run anywhere. So it can be hybrid, it can be uh, run on any cloud. And wherever you can run it, uh, it should run. And so, uh, to answer the question there, you can certainly break out the database and run it on any of the cloud providers, uh, kind of uh, serverless database options or managed database options if you want. But uh, if you have uh, an on-prem machine that you wanna run on as well, you can uh, certainly run the same code there. Uh, we, we don't wanna kind of push in any specific direction what, what your infrastructure requirements are and really want to adapt to, you know, as many environments as we can. Brian, is anything to add there? Um, no, I think, I think that covers it well, yeah. Um, okay, let's see. This question is, uh, can we view images in Kugui not using Katana, right? Yeah, so we, uh, um, so right now that the, some of the image viewing code is built uh, just to use like a local uh, Katana web, uh, like web instance. Um, I would say that's probably still a kind of image work specific bit that's in there. Um, but yeah, we definitely have a, we have an issue logged for, uh, for taking care of that. And then following up on the license management features, um, we do have a uh, limiting functionality that is part of OpenQ, something we added in the, about a year ago. And um, it allows you to just specify arbitrary limits to put on jobs. So that way, if you have, um, you know, a specific pool of licenses you want to make available uh, to the render farm, you set that limit and any job that refuses those licenses, you just specify that limit and uh, it'll make sure that you don't consume more licenses than you have set up. The one problem there is uh, it, it's not dynamic. It's not looking at your, your license count from the license server directly. It's kind of a, a static fixed number that you're going against. Yeah, as I saw that question, it did occur to me that uh, the license limits is one of the big things that we added since, uh, since last year. I uh, didn't, didn't cover that on my slide, but yes, definitely check that out. Um, let's see, question, uh, do we know of any other studios beside SBI that have adopted OpenQ as their primary scheduler? Um, no one that I can uh, mention right now. I, I, I guess I'll answer it in a more general way and say that, uh, you know, kind of collecting uh, metrics on OpenQ usage is uh, definitely something we've we've talked a lot about doing and are and are working on as a very high priority. Uh, so, look out for um, uh, what should be a user survey uh, coming pretty soon, um, and we should be able to get some, uh, you know, be able to publish some some uh, more detailed metrics at the end of the, that survey. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, where can I find information on wrangling, how to alter the priorities of jobs in the queue, limiting a job or layer from picking up additional nodes? Um, yeah, I think that documentation is, is definitely an area where we could still use uh, a lot of work, particularly user guides around the, the GUI and some of that other functionality. Um, it's it's not, not covered very well right now or, or at all. I think we have a lot of guides on uh, getting deployments set up and getting development environments set up, but uh, the, the actual use is uh, documentation is kind of lacking right now. Um, so, you yeah, know, I can definitely uh, 
we should be making more, more progress on that soon, hopefully. Okay, is there support for a hybrid on-prem and cloud burst model, or would that be something you'd have to manage separate open cube deployments to manage? Um, no, so there's definitely, it, it is uh, supported right now. Um, I think it's right now open queue is, uh, you know, like I said, very agnostic about uh, where those nodes are running uh, as long as, um, you know, it's able to, the, the, the queue bot is able to communicate with all the RPD instances. Uh, it will be able to distribute jobs to those. Uh, of course, there's, there are some caveats there about setting up your cloud machines for licensing and uh, file management and all that and making sure your assets are available to those render nodes. Uh, so that is definitely a, consideration you have to make, but um, there's nothing in OPQ that would prevent you from, from doing that in a single deployment as well. And uh, there, are, there are a few different ways that folks are managing that. I mean, some folks are doing a kind of uh, just like a, a multiple facility deployment where they're using, they're keeping cloud and on-prem completely separate um, and kind of, you know, uh, setting the, the show, uh, you know, resource limits to, uh, you know, kind of approve shows to go to the cloud. Um, but there are also, uh, uh, you know, single facility deployments as well that just have dis different instance groups running in different places. Um, so, uh, and that will all become uh, hopefully easier as we build out more of this cloud functionality uh, with the, the summer of code work that's going on. We'll, we'll kind of lay a good base layer and then we'll, we'll build on that from there to uh, make it easier to manage those deployments directly from OpenCube so you don't have to bounce back and forth between uh, QGUI and other tools uh, quite so often. But, um, yeah, it's definitely, but we've definitely kept in mind that, you know, folks have uh, pretty complex existing cloud deployments already. So uh, we're trying to make sure as we develop the, the cloud tools that we're not interfering with that in any way. So yeah, you don't want you to require, we, we don't want to require anyone to, you know, use our GUI to create cloud groups or anything like that. Um, Um, let's see, any of the presenters more familiar with uh, Houdini PDG than I am? Not super familiar with it personally. I know this has been a thing that has been, uh, that has come up a few times before. So I, I think it's certainly something we need to, to look into uh, is how to better integrate PDG um, as a, uh, kind of scheduling extension for Houdini. Um, so yeah, if there's anyone with specific Houdini experiences that uh, you know is interested in contributing, yeah, we'd love to to have help in that area. I think. Yeah, definitely. Okay, looks like uh, that's all we've got. Uh, for Q and A in the chat, um, yes, um, as it says in the chat, um, if you uh, if you have any any follow up questions, definitely join us on the uh, ASWF Slack uh, on the OpenQ channel. Um, you know, just uh, either either for this session or uh, um, you know, in general, uh, we're happy to answer questions there or on the mailing list. Or um, yeah, hope to see you there.